All right. So I uh, hope you all had a good weekend. By the way, thank you all for uh, sending in your assignments on time. Um, so uh, well, I'll just say thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I should be able to have them back to you uh, with comments by this Friday. Um, and we'll do the same thing again. We'll have another uh, assignment. I'll try and get it to you before Friday, but it'll be due two weeks from this upcoming Friday, just like this one was. So that's a decent amount of time. Um, um, it should be a decent amount of time to do this um, uh, uh, if you get started early. Um, now, um, all right, so we're, we're in the third week, and uh, we have that week off, which uh, I think most of us spent the week off shoveling <laughs> or trying to slog through. We've got two people who were in Chicago, uh, the few people in the, the Northeast, and I'm in New York, and I think only uh, Tammy lucked out um, down in Miami area. Um, so most of us, I think, spent the time shoveling. All right, so in any event, we're going to turn the corner now, and uh, in week three is kind of where we start really talking about statistics and analysis and stuff like that. So what I'd like to do with today's lecture is really cover primarily the two top sections here, how to conduct data analysis, which is an overview of, um, of exactly what it says. Uh, and um, this is no joke. This is you know, a method that I've kind of used uh, over the years. Uh, and often use over the years, and I think it works pretty well. And then what we'll do is we'll take um, uh, as many, well, I think we'll have maybe 10 or 15 examples um, that we'll cover in the uh, data analysis example. So we'll, we'll turn the crank uh, doing that. Um, all right, so before we get going, what questions do you have on what we've covered thus far um, in, the, in the course? Any questions or comments or thoughts before we get going? Um, this is Steve. I'm I'm still grappling with um, IRR, um, what it actually means and and how to use it. Okay. All right. Let me um let me see if I can pull up uh, one of the. Well, let me ask you this. Did you? How about NPV? Is that pretty comfortable? Are you pretty comfortable with NPV? Net present value. Yeah. You're pretty comfortable with that. Okay. So, um... If you have some, this is Tammy, Mark, if you have something fast, I wouldn't mind just running over it, because reading through it and stuff, and I think maybe just like a drawn example sure. might help me a little more, and I'm sorry to take up other people's time, but... Sure. Let's just... I'm with Steve. <clears throat> no, that's, that's, that's fine. Let's just do an example um, uh, uh, on, um, on the fly here. And so I'm just going to open up an Excel spreadsheet, and we will we'll talk about it. So um, let's say that we have uh, that we're contemplating a project, and uh, this particular project um, there's a certain let's say let's just call it black belt project. <laughs> okay, and um, this certain project has a has an upfront cost. Okay, and then um, there's going to be a, uh, a benefit um, in year one. I'll just call this Y1, and let's just pull this out for a few years. Let's say three years benefit. Okay, so far so good. Nothing, we haven't really put any magic in here. But I uh, want to make sure that we understand the context. Uh, right, uh, somebody calling, I just had to put that off. Okay. So let's just say that there's a, uh, there's a cost to this project because we have to you know, allocate time for a black belt. We have times, we have some, uh, whatever, ad additional cost um, that we have. Let's just call that um, $100,000. So I'm going to put in a minus 100 here, okay, to, to symbolize that it's a negative, it, it's, we're losing money on it, okay? So that's $100,000. And after the first year, we're expecting this to return um, uh, a value of uh, $150,000 um, in its, let's say, in its next three years. So it's a $150,000 return over the next three years. Okay, so far the setting makes sense? I'm really asking you, Steve, and Tammy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. 
So um, one of the things that we can think about is um, is uh, 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 now that money today, and one of the one of the reasons why um, I, I, that a lot of projects don't get done. It's not the only one, but it's that these these dollars here, the hundred fifty thousand starting in year one, year two, year three, that's going to happen in the future. So that's not as valuable to me today as this $100,000 sitting in my pocket, right? For all sorts of different reasons. I have a preference for having that money rather than money that I'm going to get in the, in the future. And that's, um, that preference is sort of summed up by something called the weighted average cost of capital, right? Or it's, it's, it's essentially an interest rate that I pay to get this money today or to, to, or to run this project today. So far, that makes sense? Yeah. Okay, so I'll call this the WAC, or the weighted average cost of capital, and let's say that it is uh, 15%. Now, this is something you definitely should talk to your, your uh, finance department about, and, um, and uh, it takes into account all sorts of different things. There's a definite calculation, but typically, I like to use something that is fairly conservative as a starting point. Um, and by conservative, I mean I'm not trying to overestimate the value of the project. Okay. Uh, now, what net present value does is it says, okay, let me add up all of the values of this, but it's not just a straight adding them up. It's actually adding um, how much that $150,000 a year from now is worth to me today, right? And that depends on this interest rate uh, as well as the amounts. So the way that we're going to do that I'll call this NPV right here, is we simply select, it's, I think it's NPV, and let's just select this, and it wants the rate first, so I'll select the rate, and then I'm going to put in all the values, okay, the vector of values there, and that tells me that this, is, that this project is worth $210,000, okay, so the minus 100 plus the 450 you know, if you just added that up, it would be 350, but because of this interest rate, we're discounting that value a certain amount. Hopefully all, all this makes some sense, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So if I make this weighted average cost of capital lower, is the value, is the net present value going to go up or is it going to go down? Just a, a gut check of seeing, seeing if we get this. If I lower this interest rate, okay. is my net present value going to increase or decrease? It increase, right? It's going to increase, absolutely. So if I put in 10% here, I claim that that 210 is going to get larger. It did. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, so uh, for once I was right about money. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, anyway uh, that makes a lot of sense. And in fact, if I make it zero, and if, if there were no interest rate at all, it should exactly be the addition of all of these things. And let's test that out. Mm -hmm. Yep, there it is. It's $350,000, right? So if I didn't have a time value, if I didn't put a time value on that money, uh, <clears throat> it, would be, uh, it would be just the addition, the sum. Okay? So let's put this back to 15. And you see it's 10, uh, uh, 210. Now here's what the IR, now, now one of the things that people don't like about this calculation is they said, well, I, I understand it all makes sense, but... Wouldn't it be good to have something that was, that was free of this number right here, that I didn't have to have the, the, the weighted average cost of capital to make my uh, evaluation of the value of this project? And that's what IRR attempts to do. Now, IRR has some issues with it because it's a scaled number. Um, it's a percentage return that it's going to give you. And so uh, we'll talk about that in a second. But imagine if I raise this weighted average cost of capital. Let's say I made it 20%. The value of the NPV is going to go down, right? Oh, yeah. The question is, how high would I make that so that the NPV is zero? Let's, let's see, okay? Let's make it 80% interest. Oh, it's got to even be higher. Let's say 110% interest. Oh, it's even got to be higher. Let's say 150% interest. Okay, there I go. So it's somewhere between 110 and 150% interest rate. Um, let's try 135 just to split the difference. Okay, that's pretty darn close. Okay, let's stop there. So 
<coughs> so if the weighted average cost of capital were 140% interest, if we were paying 140% interest on this money, this project would not be valuable to do. So if we had, uh, uh, so here's the point. That's pretty, that's a pretty, n nobody's going to pay that interest rate, right? So that's actually a measure of how valuable that project is, how high I would have to raise this weighted average cost of capital to get zero net present value. And that's exactly what the IRR is. The IRR is the value of the weighted average cost of capital, the interest rate, such that my net present value would be zero. The higher the IRR, the better the investment. Okay, let's, let's test this to make sure. And I always get this wrong in Excel. Excel has some funkier things, so let me actually just type this in. IRR. There we go. And uh, it wants the values. See, it does it backwards. It wants the values and then the guess. Uh, I'll just guess it's uh, 1. Okay. And it should return. There it is right there. You see it's the same number. Well, you know, within fr it, it, it's the same number <laughs> between friends. <laughs> if I tweak this, I would get it to be, it, there we go. <laughs> there we go. So that's what that number is. The IRR uh, is the number of the weighted average cost of, cap cost of capital such that, such that the net present value is equal to zero. The higher IRR, the better the investment, generally speaking. Okay, does that more or less make sense? Yeah. Okay, great. So let, let's do one more just so that we kind of drive home the point. And I'll do BB Project 2 here. So, whoops. So here's a second uh, black belt project. Now, this is a smaller project. We're only going to invest $10,000. So let's do that. And it's going to be worth, um, it's going to be worth $25,000 over the next three years. Let's Let's even make it better on the third year. Gives a third, a, you know, a, a larger return. What would the IRR and the NPV of that be? So let me call this NPV one. Let me call this NPV two. Okay, and we'll move this down a little bit, and we'll call this IRR one and IRR two. I think it'll have a higher R, R, R percentage. Yeah. So let's let's see if that's true. So uh, that's a great guess. And let's see if that's true, okay? So let's first of all take a look at the net present value. Uh, and any guesses uh, from somebody who's not Mike <laughs> about uh, what the NPV is going to be? Is it going to be higher or is it going to be lower? Oh, maybe I should. Mike, what's your guess? The magnitude is going to be lower because you're dealing with less money. The magnitude is going to be lower. That's, that's, a, that's a really good guess. Let's see if that's true. And I wish Excel were consistent on this. I, I guess I shouldn't blame them too much, but um, all right, there we go. And in fact, it is. This is really only worth $43,000, uh, okay? So um, that's interesting, but now let's see the IRR, okay? And I, I don't think I have to put in the guess. Look at this. Now, the IRR is 247%. So the IRR on the second project is higher. So from a percentage basis, the IRR is a better investment, but from a dollar value, it's not. And so that's why it's kind of important to look at both. What would happen if you only did projects that were above a certain IRR, or if you only took the best IRR projects? You might not actually get as much return or as much value as you would doing lower IRR projects. So that's kind of at least one, one way of looking at that. I, I like this idea, this measure of looking at IRR versus NPV, but it's not the only story. Okay? Okay. All right, excellent. That, that, hopefully that helped a bit. So, Mark, this is Regina. So when yep. you're doing the IRR, IRR, just because I'm, I'm still struggling a little bit with it, you're mm -hmm. just, I get the calculation, but it says guess, and you're entering in one. Yeah, so here's what's going to... It's gonna... the guess part that I'm like, I'm looking oh, for. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, so let me just, um, 
let me just uh, do the following. I'm not going to guess this time, and it still does it. All right, so <laughs> let's not worry about that. Um, okay. Th that, um, the reason why uh, the guess is in there is because this is what's called an iterative function in Excel. So unbeknownst to us, <laughs> Excel, IRR is actually, <laughs> is actually a calculation that takes a guess and it calculates a value, then it takes another guess and tries to optimize. We'll do this by the, I hate to really, uh, to really do this to you, but in the eighth week of the class, we're going to cover some of these techniques. Okay. So, so in any event, what it, what it does, let me see if I can draw this up. What it does is it finds some sort of function, okay? And let's say that it's, um, that it's trying to minimize this function. And uh, it takes a guess. This might be its guess, its first guess. Uh, let's just call this x1. And then it calculates a y. And let's make this, let's make the bottom zero. It doesn't have to be exactly zero. But let's say we guess at x1 and it comes out there. Then what it does is it iterates and it says, OK, now let me take x1 and plug it in and see if I can find a better solution. And it may find x2, which is actually a little bit lower. So it would say, okay, now let me use X2 and see if I can find better. And it might find X3, which is a little bit higher. I'm just making this up at this point, right? And it says, nope, this is no good. Let me go back between here. And it just searches a little bit. Eventually, it might find this number right here, which is the exact value that's right. Okay? So it's an iterative sort of optimizer. Thank you. But you can get around it by not putting anything in there. <laughs> Which is helpful. This is good. All right. Excellent. Uh, thank you for that uh, question. What other questions do you have before we move on? Whoops. Before we move on, dot org. Okay. IRR, NPV, uh, uh, something that maybe we'll do one more example a little bit later um, through the class, but uh, something that I think, you know, that's like kind of riding a bicycle. Once you get it, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to forget it, although the mechanics in Excel I always tend to forget. Like, uh, it turns out that if there's some things, if, if the IRR doesn't increase, if it starts decreasing, Excel sometimes throws up at you. Um, but uh, those are just those are some details. Okay, well, if there's not further ado, uh, we're going to go into um, uh, these, uh, uh, these sections, um, how to conduct data analysis and the introduction to control charts. Uh, I'm sorry, and the data analysis examples. Um, and um, we're going to do a lot of this sort of off the page, but we'll be covering everything that's in these slides uh, between 2 and 17. So starting out in this, um, uh, in how to conduct data analysis. Now, as a number of you know, I've been a, um, I kind of split my hats in terms of, uh, of what I do. I guess I split them in thirds. Um, uh, in one of my jobs is, I do Six Sigma type of analysis, and that's largely process, uh, running teams and, and, and projects like that. Um, that's one hat that I wear. I also wear an analytics hat because I'm a trans statistician and engineer, and so I help a lot of my clients uh, deal with analytics issues. Um, and uh, uh, the third hat is actually uh, doing some management um, that I occasionally get to do, uh, which is fun. And, Makes my makes me lose my hair and all the rest of it. All right, and in one of my uh, uh, sort of alter egos, where I do a lot of data analysis, I run across a lot of teams that really don't know how to how to think about it. So we're going to start out by thinking uh, by talking about sort of what are the preconditions for thinking about it, um, and then I'll give you a couple of props to use. Um, I use them every once in a while. I still use them when I get stuck. I use them a lot when I, uh, when I consult, uh, but they're props for you to pull out to move on data analysis or move in the right way. And it's going to link you to a system that's going to hold uh, the main thing. Uh, the main thing, which is uh, for you, is going to be t uh, two things. One is which tool do I choose? That's the sort of the mechanics of it. Which tools do I choose? Um, and, and the second thing is, how do I communicate the results that I get from data analysis? Because I've got to tell you, that's one of the things that uh, I'm sure most or all of you have, um, 
have experienced is, uh, you know, an analyst who does a lot, who does, who does a lot of work. Um, they may do, you know, very detailed work, but when it's presented, it's really hard to glean what are the insights from it or what are the conclusions from it. Um, and as an analyst, I think that that's always the struggle, too, is how to create that narrative from the data um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, does anybody online read the 538 blog, which is uh, Nate Silver? If you're into sports or politics or uh, they're not as good on the science end, uh, they occasionally do it and, and somewhat miss the mark. But if you're into sports and politics, they have a lot in economics. They have a lot of good uh, analysis on there where they're really trying hard to write a story from the from the numbers. Um, now, just this is just a you know I, I I think I have to give the Surgeon General's warning for all of these recommendations. If you are on the right side of the political spectrum, be prepared to occasionally get angry on that site. Okay, so I'm just letting you know that that there's definitely a couple of the writers there clearly have uh, left leaning political views. So if what's the site again? Uh, the site is 538. It's a uh, uh, 538 blog, and you'll find it if you spell it out. You will get it. Nate Silver is the guy. Let me write that down, actually, so that we all see it. So it's 538, blog, and the guy's name is Nate Silver. And actually, even if you're on the, even if you're on the left, you occasionally get mad as well. <laughs> all right. Uh, anyway, worth reading. Good stuff in there. Um, okay. Let us, as the rabbit said, get into it. So, so really, the objectives in this is just after we've finished, we should be able to explain how to organize and approach the da data analysis. So here are a few preliminaries before we get going. If we're talking strictly about Six Sigma, there's lots of different places where you can use what we're going to learn here in the measure, analyze, and improve phase, and even in the control phase. However, as I said, this is sort of a general knowledge of analysis, which you can use anywhere. Um, in, uh, in business. Now, first of all, let's start out with this. Now, there's no question that, um, you know, I, I, I have uh, a couple of different advanced degrees. One of them is in statistics. And I can be totally honest with you and tell you that I have only scratched the surface of statistics and statistical analysis and mathematics. And so the question is sort of, what chance do I have <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I, I don't have, I didn't have the time to go to graduate school or anything like that. Well, you're, first of all, you're here learning, and the beauty is that, you know, once you learn sort of this system, at least you'll have a hook onto which when you learn a new tool, you can say, oh, it goes here, I get it. So the idea here is to sort of clarify your thinking. But I remember when I was in um, uh, uh, early in graduate school, I did a co-op job with an engineer, and, uh, you know, he said, oh, I, I hate statistics because I always thought that it was, um, um, you know, it's like walking into a forest and you have to have a different saw to cut down every different tree. And um, I think that, uh, you know, here was a very smart guy. He was a professor in electrical engineering, and uh, he really didn't get it um, because I, uh, um, I had some good professors in, uh, in statistics, and they really helped put the whole picture together. So that's really what we're trying to do here is in the system is to put together a way of thinking about it all so that, um, so that uh, we'll be able to choose tools and make a story every time. That's the main thing. And avoid analysis paralysis. All right, so here we go. So here are the key concepts of all these. Um, so first, things first. Okay, we're going to use with the KISS, the KISS principle I'm not talking about Gene Simmons here. I'm talking about the keep it simple <coughs> statistically. All right? So the KISS principle is we're going to keep it simpler, uh, simple statistically. If we can say what we need to say with two variables, great. We're going to do that. If we can say what we're going to say with three variables, okay, we'll do that. But we should start to say things with two variables before we use three variables, three variables before we use four variables, etc. Okay? So we're going to spend a lot of time learning one variable statistics, then we'll do two variable statistics, and so forth. That's the first uh, principle. Keep it simple. Second thing is, never ever do analysis in a vacuum. 
one of my absolute hated phrases is, let's let the numbers speak for themselves. I'm sure I've used it before, too. <laughs> um, so if anybody digs up an old video where I'm saying that, um, um, that you know, I can have my John Stewart moment on that one. But in any event, um, no analysis in the vacuum. Numbers don't speak for themselves. You have to give them voice. You have to give them a narrative. In fact, when we collect data, in our last discussion, we found that, of course, uh, it matters how you collect data, what the context is, how you measure it, what your definitions are, that actually determine what those, what those uh, data points and what the data set means. So all data have to have context, um, or you really don't know what you're doing, okay? And then finally, whenever we finish, we have to make a conclusion, all right? We can't just leave it sitting out there. If we, if, we, uh, if we do some analysis and don't make a conclusion, like, for example, if we say, I'm going to do some analysis to determine whether or not um, smoking causes cancer, um, at the end of my analysis, I have to have some sort of statement that sums that up. Um, and so, um, uh, and it lets me understand how to act. Um, I make a conclusion and I say, and therefore this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to not do anything. I'm going to investigate further. I'm going to take specific action. All right. Um, so those are the, that's sort of the pre-concepts. Pre, uh, pre All right. So now let's get into the rules of data analysis, and there's only three of them that you absolutely have to remember in order to be a good, analysis, uh, a good analyst. Now, I've seen plenty of good analysts who, now it's not sufficient, but it's necessary. So in other words, you need to know these three rules. I'm not going to make you a good an analyst if you know these, but you can't be a good analyst if you, if you don't know these. So rule number one is whenever you have a data, you have to plot the data. Rule number two is you have to plot the data. And rule number three is you have to plot the data. And when I'm saying this, a lot of times you really do need to look at it multiple times. Um, one con two contexts that we're going to often look at are look at the data uh, aggregated and look at it over time. Um, that's going to tell you different things. I'm going to add a caveat to this that my uh, friend Tom, oh, I can't remember his last name now, my goodness. He's at Los Alamos National Labs. He's a professional statistician. He saw this and he said, yeah, Mark, but it's not enough. You also have to look at the plot. So it's not enough just to plot the data. He said he has to tell his uh, uh, people that he teaches to look at the plot as well. Okay? Graph the data, look at the graph. All right. Hopefully all this makes sense. Now, why do that? It's because calculated numbers, while they're wonderful, they don't do some things, po they do some things poorly that plots are absolutely excellent at. And as an analyst that's trying to look for improvements and, and the essence of what's going on, these are the things that are the most important things when we look at a plot that we're going to do. Those things are outliers, the overall shapes of data, different perspectives like trends, um, upwards, downwards, patterns. Um, plots re reveal things that, that calculations, I won't say they can't, they can, but you really have to have a lot of savvy. The good news is, we have computer programs now that can plot the data over and over. So, so um, we're good at it now. All right, so, um, so we have one more precondition, and then I'm going to show you the system, and then we'll do a bunch of examples. The third precondition, um, actually, we're just, let's, just go into the, um, let's just go into the system right now. So, so if, we, if we get those things that we're going to keep it simple, we're never going to do analysis in the vacuum. We're going to make conclusions after we're done. And we're going to plot the data all the time. Um, those are the preconditions that we're going to go into. All right. So uh, here is the system. All right. So step one, um, step one, draw your box. Draw a box, OK? <laughs> This is simple enough, right? So this stands for your process. This is your process or whatever. It's a function, whatever it is. Okay? So if it's, um, let's do the example of the waiting in line at the supermarket or at Walmart. 
this was, um, our process was waiting in line, right? So that's it. That's our process. The second thing is we're going to uh, draw arrows, draw our input and output arrows. And these are the variables that we're measuring. This is our data. And I really do mean this, really draw it, okay? So these are our Ys, these are our outputs, and these are our Xs. X1, X2, whoops, X3, X4, X5, but it could be X any. Let's see if I can erase this. Whoops, erased a little too much. There we go, X1, X2, X3, X4, X5. And uh, we've been calling these outputs outputs or KOVs or uh, we'll even call them responses and on this side we're talking our inputs or sometimes we call them drivers okay all this making some sense in waiting in line at the DM, at the uh, at the supermarket our output might be our outputs might be something like turnaround time right how long, or wait time, let's call it wait time. Yeah. That might be our, let's just stop at that, and I think we, I think we get it. Or, or maybe uh, uh, the bill accuracy. Right, did they, did they charge me correctly? All right. So those are two different things that we could measure, right? Hopefully that, those two things make some sense. What would be, if we measured wait time, what would be some things that we also measured on the input side? Uh, start? Yeah, we can measure start time. Okay, let's measure start time. What else? How about number of items? How about number of items that I had? Okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Didn't mean to interrupt. Number of people in line as well. I had items too, but oh, number of people. Number of people ahead. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. Number of uh, available registers. Okay, number of available registers. Number of registers. Okay, and let's just say type of register that I'm standing in. Okay. And that's enough, I think, to do this example. Does everybody get this last one? Like I could stand in a. Uh, uh, 10 items or less or 20 items or less or I could stand in the self-serve checkout or I could sta stand in just the general old register. Make sense? Yep. Okay, excellent. Once I've got all of those things marked down, now what I do is I, I label these. As, so this is the first step in the process. The second step is I label each of these as either number or cat variables. Now, what do I mean by that? I'm going to come back to this in just a second, but this is a key concept that I'm going to, that I'm going to get this, and this is the numcat principle. All right? Now, <clears throat> I talked to a lot of people. When I learned this stuff, I learned all sorts of things about data. I learned that there's continuous data. I learned that there's discrete data. Let me see if I can spell it right. I learned that there... I wrote it sloppily enough, so you can't tell. <laughs> Old trick. I learned that there's um, that in within discrete data, there's nominal data, there's ordinal data. I learned that there's ratio data, and on and on and on and on and on. And here's the thing to remember right here: I don't care. <laughs> okay, I don't care. All of these things are going to be mapped into one of two things. The first thing is number data, which we'll call num. This is data that I do math on. I can subtract it. I can add it. Whatever, right? A good example of this would be turnaround time or wait time in line. Uh, Steve, if you and I were standing in line and you waited 10 minutes and I waited 12 minutes, you would wait, uh, I would have waited two minutes longer than you did, right? I could do yep. math on that. I could take 12 minus 10 and it means something. All right, the second type of data is cat data. 
or category. This is categories. So I can't really do math on it, but I can categorize it. Here I can't do math. So a good example on this one would be eye, eye color. I, now I don't know about a number of you, but I happen to have blue eyes. Um, I'm going to take a guess here. Tammy, what color eyes do you have? Blue. Oh, you also have blue. Okay. Uh, Regina? Uh, green. You have green eyes. Okay. So, uh, Regina, I'm going to ask you a very easy question. What's green minus blue? <laughs> green minus blue? <laughs> you, can't, you can't do it, right? <laughs> you can't do it. Yellow. Oh, oh it's yellow. <laughs> right. Right. Well, we learn those sorts of things, and maybe that's not such a good idea or a good example. But, um, you know, I drive a Camry, for example, and uh, somebody who drives a Honda Civic or, or um, a Tercel, you know, you might say, well, what's Camry minus Tercel or what's Camry divided by Tercel? Now, you could measure things about that and come up with an answer, but, uh, what, but whatever. I think you guys get it, right? There's stuff that we categorize and stuff that we can do math on. So we're not going to worry about any of this. What we're going to do is we're going to label all our variables num and cat. Let me see if I can get back to Oh, good. I got back to it. So let's go back on this one. Let's look at wait time. What is wait time? Is that a num or a cat? Num. That's a num. I can do, I can do uh, math on that one, right? Okay, so that's a num. And in fact, I'll just, short, uh, I'll just short change this by, or shorten this by just putting an n. Uh, let's take a look at this. Now, on the, on the left-hand side, what is start time? That's a, yeah, that's, yeah, that one's a little bit tough, and maybe we'll hold off on this one, <laughs> if we will. I, I would say that this is going to be a num for us, but uh, let's go on to some of these other ones. How about number of items? Num. Um, that's a num. Yeah, that's a dead giveaway, right, when we say number of. How about number of people? In line ahead of us? Num. That's a num. Number of registers, that's a num. And type of register is a cat. 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 Okay, got it. So um, it turns out that, and so here's now the point. What we're, and, and if we look at bill accuracy, a bill is either accurate or it's not. It's either correct or it's not. So bill accuracy, if I'm looking at a single data point, this is a little bit tricky. If I'm looking at a single bill, it's going to be a cat. But if I'm looking at aggregated over a week or something like that, it might be a num. So we have to be, excuse me, we have to be a little bit careful and look at the details um, before we just decide num and cat. But generally speaking, we can do it. Now let's take a look at, um, let's just take a, a look at this first one. And we'll say, okay, here I've got a uh, number of items versus wait time. So here I've got num and num, so num num, and uh, if that makes sense to everybody. So now I'm going to look at, and I'll just draw this up um, on the bottom. If I look at number of items and uh, wait time, I'll just that's num and num. So that's going to drive me to, <clears throat> as we'll find out very soon, a uh, scatter plot when I do a plot. All right, that's going to drive me to a number of different uh, a number of different tools that are specific to number versus number. Okay, and all we have to really do is walk through those tools. All right, so 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 far, hopefully this is fairly fairly understandable. What we're going to do is we're going to take each one of these in turn, the input versus the output, and we're going to ask the following. Uh, we're going to do the following now. So for each of these, for each pair, we're going to do the following. We're going to conceptualize. This is, again, wait time, and our input is number of items. And this was num, and this is num, right? So that tells us what to do. And then here's how to do it. This is how to do it. I'm going to give you another prop. So here is the second prop that I'm going to give you. And uh, do any of you guys golf or gals golf? I know not today. All right, so if you golf, maybe this would be easier to remember. But if you don't, uh, just think PGA, right? 
So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to go through this PGA wheel. And what does it mean? It means for this particular output pair, which was wait time versus number of items, we're going to start from practical. This is what the first P, this is what the P means, practical. G stands for graphical. And A stands for analytical or anal. Analytical. Okay. Um, so what we're doing is uh, we're going to start from a practical question and we're going to end at the practical question. This is really business, business, uh, business uh, conclusion. All right? So let me do the example here and then we'll see how we do it over and over. We're looking at wait time in a supermarket based on number of items. The first P right here is I wonder if Number of items, right, that's a plug-in, drives wait time, or does. If we're going to make it a question, I guess we put does. Let me take that. I'm just going to make a, a comment here. There we go. That's our practical, or our first P. That's P. All right, the second one is we're going to make a graph of it. It turns out that this is going to, the second is a graph, and this one turns out to be a scatter plot. I'll draw that up for you uh, just quickly so you'll see it. This is going to be our old XY plot. Bunch of plots here. <coughs> looks, say it looks like this. All right, I'm just making these numbers up, folks. Finally, not finally, penultimately, I guess. We are going to uh, analyze. This means make a calculation. Calculation. Analyze means make a calculation. That means, that might mean for this particular thing, I get a y equals uh, a b0 plus b1x equation. Okay, where these B's, B1s and B0s, or B0s and B1s are actually really, val really numbers, like 5 and 2.3 and all that. Okay, and finally, we, we're not done until we go back to the P. What can I do about it? Okay. And this is usually one of three things. Ignore, the old do nothing. Second is further investigate. And the third is take action now. Take action. I'll just say take action. All right? So that's it. For each pair, we draw this PGA wheel and we progress through each of these questions. We start by saying, I wonder if the number of items drives wait time. Then we plot it. Then we make a calculation. And then we ask, what can I do about it? And then we move on to the next one. Conceptually, this is as if we're walking through each of these inputs and essentially either drawing uh, an X through it if it doesn't matter. Like, let's say start time didn't make a difference. We would draw an X through it and say, you know what? When I do my improvements, I don't want to make improvements based on start time. I didn't really find anything that was going on there. Um, on the other hand, if we found that number of items was indeed a driver of this, I would eff effectively circle it and then say, OK. Uh, when I make my improvements, I'm going to make sure that I make improvements, th that I'm going to think of maybe something I can do that can alleviate that situation for the number of items. Um, likewise, I would go through all these different things, like maybe number of people in line matters, uh, register doesn't, then type of register does. Then I'm done. I can either go ahead and make my solutions right then, or I can do deeper analysis based on multiple variables. But at this point, we're going to stop, and we're going to say, uh, uh, that's pretty good. I can tell you that if I start out with something that is... Um, 
that where a, a team, where I have a team that's looking at something like this, a bunch of different Ys and they, or Xs for these Ys, and they come out with one or two of these circled and the others we're not going to do anything about, that's huge because then they can go into the improve phase um, with, um, <clears throat> or they can do a lot more, de they can do deeper analysis that's really directive. Um, um, so that's it. Um, we're going to get lots of practice on this in the following examples, uh, or in the following section, but uh, basically that's it in a nutshell. Draw the box, label them all N and C, and then go through each one of these and either circle them or don't based on that PGA wheel. Okay? I'm going to stop here for just a moment and ask for que and ask for questions. <laughs> okay, I think enough of my yakking. Uh, let's um, let's uh, let's uh, go to the. Uh, I want to show you a couple different things. One is on slide number eight. This is a job aid. So, whoops. Come on back to me. There we go. On, job, on slide eight, this right here is a job aid, and this is for one variable. Okay, when I only have one variable, when it's only when I'm only thinking of outputs, these are the tools that are available to me. I have several plots and I have several calculations. So, for example, when we look at one variable, which we will do very soon. Um, I can do a histogram, I can do a time series plot. A little bit later we're going to add to that a control chart, uh, but today we're just going to do histograms and time series plots and maybe a box plot. Um, when I'm doing calculations, I can look at centers, I can look at spreads. Um, so, you know, you might want to uh, um, use this as a job aid right now. Um, uh, if I have category data, I could make a pie chart, I could make a bar chart, I could do a Pareto uh, chart. Um, again, we'll cover these um, today and subsequent lectures. Um, if I'm doing some calculations, I might do data tables, etc. All right, so that's, uh, that's that one. And then uh, this is just kind of reinforcing categories and, and, uh, and numbers. And this is our process. And here is um, when we have, this is a... Um, <clears throat> this is not comprehensive, but this covers through one output and one input. And I tell you, if you can just get these down pat, um, you'll be ahead of 90% of the, of the people that are out there. So um, this just tells you for a, uh, what type of output do I have, what type of input do I have, what are the graphs that I could, that I could use. And I've just put one in here, but uh, there are a number that we're going to look at. But I've just put one in that's, that hopefully that'll help. And what are the calculations uh, that we're going to be able to do? Um, I won't promise to do all of these calculations today, but I want to show you where they are and um, give you, stretch you a little bit, hopefully, by, uh, by getting you to do it and then, and then asking what the interpretation might be. Um, you might be wrong a couple of times today in the lecture, so don't worry about that. Um, we're with friends. Um, and uh, it's best to take a guess and be wrong. I mean, that's how I learn most of what I know. Okay. <clears throat> so you might want to mark this page as well. Okay. So I'm going to take a minute here and just let you write down in your journals what are the key takeaways of this lecture um, so far um, that we had. Uh, showed you the model, gave you the preconditions to keep it simple, um, and gave you the two props. The props are the process box and the PGA wheel. Um, so I'm going to stop and uh, just give you a minute, and then we'll roll on to the examples. We will just do one after another.
Okay. All right. Let's go into the uh, let's go into the next section. And now um, I'd like to do this as again kind of a workshop. And uh, so I'm going to ask you uh, to do some of this stuff. Now I'm going to use uh, today exclusively Excel stats. And I think you'll see <clears throat> why using Excel stats is going to be really good for us as we're walking uh, before we run. There will be times uh, during the class where Minitab is going to be helpful. Um, and uh, I'll let you know those times. A again, it's not a required purchase. Uh, late in the class, in like week six, I'm going to ask that you download a demo and install that. Um, uh, uh, but that's, that's not for now. Uh, we don't need to worry about that. But right now it's all uh, data analysis examples in Excel stats. Okay, so let's kind of start through this. We're on slide 16, but as I said, I'm just going to move pretty quickly and we'll do this. Um, I'm going to cover everything that's in the lecture, um, uh, and, but then you can go through the slides again to kind of reinforce this as you're doing it. Okay, um, so the objectives that I have is to kind of um, initiate all of us into using the, pr the system that we just had to execute what I would, what I would call sound analysis for the following situ situations. We're going to do two uh, examples of one variable analysis. The first two are just this. One is when I have a num and one is when I have a cat. Okay, so we're going to do one num and we're going to do one cat. And uh, the second set is when I have an output and an input. Okay, whether that's a uh, num or a cat and same thing here. So we're going to cover three situations uh, for here. A category output, category input, number output, category input, number output, put number input. What ha uh, all right, so you'll notice that there's one missing, and that's category output, <coughs> number input. In those cases, you can just switch them around and do the analysis that way. But I think you'll find that the one that we're covering here is the much more common uh, situation of the two. All right, well, let's get started. And uh, here's, uh, yes, here's where we are. Uh, let's get started, and we're going to start um, with one variable analysis, and um, we'll start with one numerical variable, um, and uh, there is an example on 20 um, that I may ask you to go through, but uh, we're going to just start out with, uh, whoops, with uh, doing an example uh, together. So first thing is, I'm going to crank up the old Victrola on uh, Excel statistics. So I've got Excel statistics open. I am using um, Excel 2013, but this does work in everything uh, Excel 2007 afterward. Actually, there's one that, actually, that still works for earlier Excels, but it looks very different uh, than this. So the first thing is, uh, let's do a data example. Let's do an example here. Let me see if I can pull this up. That's not what I wanted. Okay. So uh, let's see. Yeah. All right. So let's suppose that um, let's suppose that we that we collected the following uh, data right here. And we had, uh, now this isn't a lot of data. I'm going to see if I can find one with a little more data. I thought that I had more data there. All right, let's just go ahead and do this one uh, together. And then I think starting the next one, we will uh, we'll move into something else. Okay, so uh, let's suppose that um, I'm going to ignore column number one for just a moment, hiding or column A. All right, let's say we had the following. We went to, uh, uh, hopefully, does everybody love the DMV here? Um, I don't know about you, but when we go there, uh, one of the things I, I often care about is how long I wait in line, okay? So we are doing the example that's on uh, slide 20, I guess. So if we went into the DMV and we're running a project and we wanted to baseline our project first, one key output variable, or KOV, that we might use is wait time. How long did I wait, or did, pe did people wait in line, maybe at peak, at peak times? Well, let's say we went out, and on consecutive days, 
<clears throat> we, we sampled, let's say, one person each day, and we measured how long they waited in line in minutes, okay, uh, at that DMV. Let me get the right data file. I think this is not the data file that's in there. You may as well use the data file that's in our, that is in our example. There it is. Where's DMV? There it is right there. DMV wait times. There we go. Okay, so this is the time. Um, th these are the times in minutes that people waited in line at the DMV. Okay, and they're in time order. And that's kind of important to just note. All right, so... Let's just kind of walk through the motions. Let's draw our box up right here. This is what we've got. And uh, let's see, M uh, Mike, uh, is wait time a number or a cat? Number. That's a number, okay? So, again, this isn't too tough uh, once we get the hang of it. And like I said, we'll start early. So here's how, uh, so let's start with our PGA wheel. I should have done this before. Now, this doesn't work as well with uh, our, um, with when we only have one number output uh, because we're, our question of, I wonder if something drives the output, doesn't make sense. The question when we only have one is uh, uh, just I'm looking at, I wonder, I'm going to, ba I want to baseline, I want to baseline my data. Okay, so that's really the question here. So let's start out by putting that. That's the first thing. First things first, we want to make a graph of it, right? So um, we have to, in order to do this, what we're going to do is we're going to get this into Excel stats. All right, so let me open this Excel stats again. Oops, thought I was in the right one. Let's see if I am, there it is. Okay, so sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes you have to double, you have to open it up again. Just be aware of that. So we'll do this, and um, we have one variable, not to be ridiculous about this, but we have one variable, and it's a num. So if we look at Excel stats, and let's be kind of dumb about this, it looks like there's one num here, okay? So let me press that button and see what happens. Blam. Oops, I have, nothing's going to happen. Sorry, I pressed it wrong. I want to select my data first. Click on one num, and it brings up one num analysis for me, okay? So here's the analysis that we want to look at. We want to look at a plot, right? The two plots that we want to look at for one num analysis are, if you, let me erase that, um, are a histogram. And we also want to look at a time series plot, if we can. Now, uh, there's a reason why I went through great pains telling you the data were collected in time order, and that's so we, we can look at a time series plot. So this first one is a histogram, okay? And um, um, we'll come back to this, but I want to show you if you kind of mosey on down, you will eventually you get something called a mean plot as opposed to a nice plot. There's box and whisker plots. Here we go, the plot of time by case number. So uh, in this case, because the order that we collected the data was actually time, this is basically a time series plot. So those are the two things we want to look at when we're looking at one num analysis, okay? And you can remind yourself of that by going to that slide eight in the previous section. Okay, so let's take a moment and uh, talk about this one first. Let's talk about the time series plot first. What does this show us, or what are the things that we're looking for in a time series plot? It's high level. Trends? Yeah, we're looking at two things, two or three things, trends, patterns, and outliers, okay? So um, I would say the first thing you want to do is kind of look for outliers. In just about any plot, that's the first thing you want to do. Um, do you guys see any outliers? Right at the end, and then... Uh Almost three early on at the high side. Yeah, so maybe there's a few outliers, maybe even one of these, but uh, okay. So again, at the moment, all this is sort of eye of the beholder outliers. 
We look at outliers because they're often pregnant in meaning or pregnant in uh, information for us. One outlier can be worth hundreds of other data points. So outliers are super important for us to look for. Time series plot is a plot of each of the measurements over, in this case, again, the order in which they were collected. Okay? All right, so that's it. Question, I'm going to move pretty quickly. So questions on time series plots? I'm going to assume we are good. All right, now something that's a little more difficult is a histogram. Now what a histogram does is actually imagine if you took, imagine if you had a, uh, oh, I don't know, do people still play like pachinko? <laughs> imagine if you had a pachinko game turned sideways and you had different bins, right? And you turned this over, you rotated this, and all these little things fell down and they all added up by knocking on top of each other, right? So that when they fell down, you'd get them accumulating uh, like so. You know, maybe here's your three high outliers. There's not too much data there. There's a lot of data here. There's not so much there, and there's one data point there. Does that make sense to everybody? It's just sort of as it's collected. That's a histogram, what we just did on the side. The histogram shows how the data accumulate um, over time or whatever, uh, how the data are accumulating, and it's a proxy for probability, okay? So the higher bars are the higher probability numbers. So if this was waiting in time at the DMV, we're much more likely to wait around 20 minutes, say 18 to 23 minutes, then we are to wait 40 minutes, right, where it seems like it's highly unlikely. In fact, in the whole data set, we don't have any that were where we waited as long as 40 minutes. Okay? <coughs> Hopefully that makes some, t some sense. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's the mechanics. Now, the way that, that uh, histograms work is you have to tell something the bin size and the number of bins, and you have to say where it goes from and to, and then it'll draw the histogram for you. Excel Stats makes a guess, which is nice, but sometimes we'll want to change this a little bit. And I'll just kind of give you a rule, and you can kind of write this down if you want on, uh, on slide 21 or whatever. I like to give a little bit of room on the left-hand side and a little bit of room on the right-hand side. So I might go from, say, 5 to 35. See what I did there? I just changed the from and the to, just to give myself a little more room. And then I start to play around with a number of classes. Now, this one's not so bad. You can see that I have uh, easily readable uh, endpoints on these, so that's pretty good. But I might want to try, say, 12 classes. That gives me a slightly different picture, doesn't it? Or what if I tried 15? That gives me a slightly different picture. So when you have a histogram, it's helpful to play around with a number of different uh, classes. Um, like what would happen if I put in 100 classes here that's not all that useful. That's sort of like, a, you know, I get a gap tooth uh, a distribution. Um, but uh, it does sort of show me, even with all this, that there's still some accumulation. So the, I think the idea is usually if you have a decent uh, histogram at some point, it'll kind of look about the same no matter how many I put in. So it's good to play around with some of this stuff. All right. Um, uh, just to also show you that you can change, like what if I did, uh, I don't know, 17. I'm going to get decimal points there. You can also change the number of decimal points um, and show the values and all this kind of stuff. So it's kind of, uh, it's kind of good. Um, it's kind of a nice little tool. Okay, so it turns out that there's lots of different types of histograms. Um, and I'm, for this, I'm going to go back to the, uh, to the regularly scheduled program here for just a moment. And there's lots of different types of histograms. Uh, there are bell-shaped histograms. You probably know this is the bell curve or something like that, bell-shaped. Um, there are skewed histograms. Now, these happen quite often. Um, now, it's, an unfor it's unfortunate that, um, that now uh, statisticians called this skewed a long time ago, um, but uh, it's unfortunate that nowadays when people say something is skewed, they mean there's something wrong. 
It doesn't, when a statistician says, says the data are skewed, it doesn't mean that there's something wrong. It just means that they have a long tail like this one does. What would be some, what would be some distributions that looked like this? What would be some variables that you think might be, might look like this? Exponential? Oh, yeah, it's right here. Yeah, it's, all, it's right there. I cheated. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Here are some distributions. When we look at the distributions, they actually look like that. Um, but, like, for example, let me give you an example. Like, heights of people or heights of adult males will look like this. There's a lot more people who are... Um, now, if I, if I recall, Dan, Dan is a very tall person. Dan... Uh, uh, if you don't mind, would you share how tall you are? 6'4". So Dan is 6'4". I am 5'8", right? So if this is, now we'll, we'll change the numbers here. Dan's going to be somewhere out here. I'm going to be somewhere here, right? If we had Shaq, Shaq is going to be way out here. Now, there's more people who are probably about 5'8 to 6' foot than there are people who are 6' foot 4'. So, it turns out that heights, of, and, and the same would go for people who are like, um, who was that guy in Fantasy Island? Herb Velachez, right? There are very few people who are, who are extremely, sh very few adult males who are very, who are like three foot two. Um, and very few people who are as tall as Shaq, you know, seven foot two or seven foot three or Manute Ball or, or however tall that guy was. So heights of people actually look something like this. Um, uh, sometimes a, a performance in a process might look something like this. Um, an example of something that looks uh, skewed might be um, salaries of people in a company. So there's, if you were looking at Microsoft, uh, you know, Bill Gates is way out here and uh, the average programmer or the typical programmer is more around here. There's a lot more typical programmers than there are Bill Gates's. Make sense? Now the acid test is, of course, you take the data and you plot it. And whatever shape it is, that's the shape that it is, regardless of your justification. What might be another one that might look skewed, though? I want to press you guys a little bit. And what might be some other data that might look skewed? Um, number of times a baseball player hits a ball. Number of times a baseball player hits a ball. Oh, per player? By player? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's very few people, and I haven't followed late, lately, but when I was growing up, it was uh, Tony Gwynn and Rod Carew, right? There's very few of those guys, who, uh, guys who get a lot of hits versus, you know, there's a lot of guys who are really good at striking out. I'm one of those guys. I played college balls. I was, I was really good at striking out. So, um, you know, I'm way over here. Um, so, yeah, so that's a good example. How about a process example? Thoughts on that one? We'll leave that open for just a moment. Um, but the rule of thumb is anywhere where you're limited on one side and unlimited on the other. Let me give you one more example from, from everyday life, and that's house prices. House prices tend to be skewed to the right, exactly like this is, because there's a limit to the least amount that we can pay, namely zero dollars, but there is no limit to the most amount that we can pay, or generally there, or that we can, <laughs> that there's an ask for it. There's a, certainly a limit that we can pay. Hopefully that makes some sense. Um, some other sort of less common ones are uniform distributions. These are something where it's the same probability all the time. This might be for something like uh, uh, times that a bus arrives between a certain window. Um, Bimodal data. This is often a shape that's very helpful because when you see something like this, um, it means that you may have a group in there that you want to find the group. What's driving that group? Okay. Uh, heights of men and women, if you mix them in, might look, uh, might look, it won't be this pronounced, but men generally are a little bit taller than women. Um, so there you go. Outliers, and then this final one right here, which I have listed as dog food which I say often arises from derived data. What I mean by that is when I see stuff like this, I think somebody's playing around with the numbers. Uh, what often happens is, is there's a cliff um, that you might find that's unnatural, that there's, there's no reason why, you shouldn't be, uh, why there shouldn't be a cliff like that on the data, um, but uh, there is, and so you wonder why it is. Okay, um, so that's one example. Um, 
since this is so important, uh, let's do one more example. And uh, let's pull out our favorite, which is wait times. Uh, I don't know why I'm having a, such a hard time getting to it. But uh, let's see if we can do that in, um, in uh, this one right here. So let's say this was wait times for, uh, oh, um, let's say this is times that you're waiting for a package. Let's say for it, when, when it's been mailed. Okay, and uh, I don't know exactly what the numbers were. How about t times that it was, uh, maybe we're waiting on p being paid for an invoice, right? So this is wait times for an invoice. Okay, which is, of course, a number. And so let's do some one num analysis on this one. Uh, I'm going to arbitrarily pick somebody else uh, or somebody from the course to help me do this. Uh, let's see, that means I have to get out of this and go to... Uh, this right here. So I am going to ask uh, Regina, can you help me do this? Sure. Whoops. Okay. Whoops. I did something uh, that I didn't want to do, which was make you the presenter. <laughs> so I'm going to make myself <laughs> the presenter again. Hopefully you can see my screen. I, however, am going to give you control of my computer. So uh, I'd like you to go ahead and do a one num analysis. Uh, in Excel statistics. So I'll help you walk through. Um, so the first thing to do is to cancel out of this. Okay. We'll cancel out of this. And you want to look up at the top and you want to see if Excel statistics is open. You'll, if it's open, you'll see a tab on the top that you can click on and open up a number of things. So see if you can find the Excel statistics. There you go. Fine. So you know it's open. So now the, tr the drill is you have to select the data and click the appropriate analysis. You can select the data however you want. I find the easiest is just to click on that column. There you go. Excellent. And go ahead and see if you can find, uh, now we have uh, one variable and it's a num, so we want to find the right analysis. That's n num. Okay. No harm, no foul on this one, but we don't have n. I guess we have n if n is equal to 1, but there's a special uh, area where it says one variable analysis. So try again. You can close that up. Okay. okay. Now, we opened up something. This is okay. We opened up something that was actually not our analysis, so we want to close this down. And so if you click on that, see that little red X that's in the middle? If you click on that, it'll close down that sheet and put us right where we were, which is kind of helpful. Okay, let's click one num. Got it. Um, and you can click replace. That's fine. Hmm. Uh, click close. I'm not sure what happened. Let me try this again, okay? I'm going to take control for just a moment. We're going to shut this down and not save. And I'm going to go ahead and open up Excel statistics. Oh, I see. It was open. Oh, lovely. This happened to me once before. Okay, and we're going to try and do this again. Let me see if I can do this again. I'll help you walk through. All right. So let's get Excel statistics open now. And let me see if, we, if this works. Okay. Uh, so it worked. I'm going to let you try it again, okay? <laughs> All right, go for it. It's open. Select the data. Yep. Mm -hmm. One num. Great. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to look at two things, right? We're going to look at the plots first. Let's first look at that time series plot. And let's see. Hey, Mark, it, I just, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, when yours opens, it opens into wait, you know, wait time, but mine doesn't open up into time at all. How do, how do we change that? Um, uh, and my, like numerical summaries for x versus for wait time. Um, you have to help me out. You mean we're right here in A2? It says x. Oh, it's, a, it's, data, it's driven by the data. Okay. Exactly. Right. Yes. Exactly. So you have to select the data and then click on well, I mean, one num, and then it should the, work. The heading for my uh, 
my example was X and not wait time. That's why. Yeah. Let me. Oh, I see. You had you had it written as X. Like right. that. I see. Got it. Um, there's also a default. Like if you just click on one num without selecting the data, you get this. See how that's a little bit different? This is the generic data that's sitting in there uh, before you do anything. Okay? So that can happen too. And if you see that, see how there's no drop-down menu? Watch what happens. Now, Regina did this earlier, and she did it beautifully. But watch what happens when I select the data, click on wait time, and now it says wait time. It also gives me a drop-down menu. The drop-down is not helpful right now, but it will be later. So anytime you see that blue X, it probably means you haven't selected your data. Okay? Good question. All right, Regina, go for it now. Let's, uh, the first thing we want to do is we want to look at the time series plot. So see if you can scroll down to that. Excellent. Overshadowed a little bit, but that's okay. There we go. So what are the sorts of things we're looking for in a time series plot? Got it. You can say it, too. <laughs> oh, this is so the outliers right there near 10, um, maybe here around 50, 70, and then up here and here. Okay, great. Excellent, excellent. Okay, and after uh, we're done with outliers, we want to look for what? Uh, the pachinko game. <laughs> uh, no, not, not quite yet. Let's stay on oh. this, this plot. We also okay. want to look for trends, right? Okay. So do we see any general up and down trends that are going there, or, or simply up or simply down or flat line? Uh, oh, yeah. It's all up and down way. trend right here, <laughs> and then uh, maybe some trending here, mm -hmm. and then... Okay, good. Now, now, generally speaking, it sounds like somebody else was trying to say something, um, so you can go ahead. I'm sorry, it was Tammy. I said it just kind of looks like it's all over the place. There's no real... Yeah. Yeah, so, so I think... I, uh, now, here's the thing. We're going to learn different tools soon um, to be able to look at all this stuff. But just today, um, you know, the main thing that we want to see is, is it generally going up? Is it generally going down? Or is it generally staying straight? I don't know. It looks like it's kind of maybe going a little bit up at the end and maybe whatever. So I'm not sure that, that, that thinking that way is helping me all, all that much. So I'm going to erase those. But those are the first things I'm thinking of. And then I think, as, you, as you, I think you were saying, is it looks like there's maybe a trend. It's trending up there. Then it looks like it went down. Maybe it's trending back up. Looks like it kind of trended down. So we can play that game. But um, just to mention in passing that the brain is better, uh, is so go uh, the human brain is so good at finding trends, it finds a lot of trends that aren't there. So we're going to use a tool <laughs> called a, a control chart to help rein in that imagination. So I think you did a great job on those outliers. Um, so um, why don't we now play the pachinko game, as, as you said. <laughs> okay. You did a great job with, the, uh, with that. Excellent. Having a little bit of trouble, I'll help uh, move you up there. I'll Thank try you. to. There we go. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Um, all right. Good. So you want to give a little bit of room on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. That's good. And... Uh, Excellent. Okay. So how would you describe, uh, before we go on, I think that's great, how would you describe the shape of this data? Which type of histogram do we have here? Pretty close to bell curve. Yeah, it looks pretty much like a bell curve, right? Excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, great job. Um, great job. Let's talk a little bit about the last part of that PGA wheel, and that was we get a baseline. We want to look at the time series plot, see how it's going over time. We'll have lots more on baselining in the next lecture where we talk about control charts and we'll talk about capability. But the second thing we want to look for is the histogram. So we know the shape. We know how it's trending over time or isn't. 
Now we'll look at a few calculations. So, for example, here up at the top, one thing I really like about Excel statistics is you just press a button and it gives you lots of stuff that you can look at. Um, it does give you the average, the mean. It gives you something called the standard deviation. And it gives you a boatload of other stuff that you may not know about or care about right now that we'll talk about a little bit later in the course. It's coefficient of variation, skewness. This is interesting, right? This might tell me how skewed the data are. Uh, kurtosis, <laughs> which I'm not going to tell you what it is, but uh, it's not all that important. Um, so I think we can gloss on past it. It also tells me the min, uh, Q1, which is the 25th percentile, the median, which is the similar to the average. You can see it's almost the same, 73, 75, 75th percentile and the maximum in the data. So it tells me a whole boatload of stuff that's in there. All right. Now, one last thing. If I wanted to uh, keep this analysis, I can go into Excel statistics. I can click on the record. Whoops. I, can s I did something stupid there. I can select something. And then if I click on the record button, it'll actually save a picture of that analysis uh, here in my data file. This is my data file that I had right here. It'll actually save it. And then if I want to go back to analysis, I just click this little uh, button right here, this little blue button, and it puts me right back where I was. For now, let's close this up. And uh, I think I want to just move on .org um, into the next thing. So that's it. That's one num. Uh, that's a uh, one num analysis. Okay, so we did DMV wait times, and there we go. So let's move into, uh, let's, let me pause here and ask what questions do you have on one num analysis? Okay. I think for the rest of today, what I wanted to do, except for maybe one cat, we'll spend a little bit more time but what I want to do is just give you a flavor for what you can actually do. We'll do more of the analysis later, but just to sh kind of show you what, how you can get to the first phase of that by doing the plot. Okay? So let's do this example on, um, on this slide, uh, which is uh, on defect types. So here, let me open up the... Uh, so let's say we have a company and that company went out and uh, they were doing safety inspections on their plant floors and uh, for each month maybe they compiled the defect types that they had and they put them uh, they put codes for those into uh, into an excel data sheet and uh, we want to examine those defect types okay so that's the context uh, we have one variable and it's going to be an output called defect types and as we'll see in just a moment it's a cat Okay, so let's, let's uh, go ahead and we'll do uh, our one cat analysis. I'm going to close down this and I'm not going to save. And I'll get up the defect types. Okie dokie. So as you can see here, we have, uh, we have uh, one variable and it's defect types. So at this point, we'll just want to do, I mean, this is uh, not rocket surgery here, folks. What type of analysis are we going to do on this one? One cat. You got it. See, that was tough, wasn't it? <laughs> we have our box. There's our variable. It's defect types, and it is a cat. Okay? So, uh, Steve, I'm going to ask you to do this for us, okay? So why don't you go ahead and do this, and I'll walk through what we're going to do uh, as this. So, Steve, I'm going to give you the controls. So, you can go for it. So have let's control? Go oh, man, there's no Excel statistics. So, we're going to have to no. close that down and just double-click on the Excel statistics, enable the ma macros, and there we go. We got it up there. All right, now go for it. Okay. <laughs> so, so, I'm in control. Okay. You're in control. So, like the data. Mm-hmm. One cat. And that's it. Well, that was tough. <laughs> uh, okay. Thank you, Steve. So with one cat, there's not a heck of a lot of analysis that we can do. All we can really do with um, categories uh, data is really look at how much data is in that category. If we just have one cat, if we just have one variable. When we have multiple variables, we'll want to slice it and dice it, and then we can do a little bit more. But okay, so 
So for this, the, the tool of choice is a bar chart, but you can see if we, at the top, we have uh, a data table. So it says, here's what the count is of each of these different defect types. RA, I have no idea what that would be. M uh, might be a mess. <laughs> I don't know, for a safety thing. Who knows what that is? Um, but as we're going down, it can show you the raw score right here, the count. Overall, there were 392 safety incidences over six months. And these are the different types, the counts, the percentages, and the proportions. Okay? And there's a, uh, a graph down below that does this, and they've revamped it to put different colors, which, I don't know, I think kind of sucks. I like it as the same color, but uh, there you have it. Um, now, Steve, if you click on uh, proportion, do me a favor and click on percentages, and you can see how that changes. Um, when you click on percentages, it actually allows you to put in error bars. You can choose between none, plus or two standard errors. More on that later. Um, uh, and you can also click on, go ahead and click on show values. You'll see what that does as well. So that just puts the counts uh, up on those, and you can change the number of decimal places. I'm just going to go ahead and do that. So it's kind of hard to read that, but this says, you know, 31% of my errors were M. 32 were S2, 18% were PL, 9% were RA, etc. Hopefully that makes some sense. And then if we want to put in, take those out and put in those error bars, we can do that. Like I said, more on those error bars uh, later. Okay. Um, Steve, if you can scroll down a little bit. Great, thank you. It went down. Went a little bit too far. <laughs> there we go. Um, so you can see that we also have uh, we also have a pie chart on here, and the pie chart also lets us add different things. If you're in love with pie charts, uh, I'm going to try and convince you otherwise. But uh, if you're in love with pie charts, there's a pie chart for you, and it basically says the same thing. Like here, uh, let's uh, let me put Steve on the spot here. If you were on the team that said, <clears throat> uh, remember the context was a safety inspections over six months. If you were on the project team that said, hey, we want to reduce uh, the number of safety incidences, where would you start if you saw this data? With, uh, with that one, the highest percentage. You got it. And those are? S2. There you go. S2 and M and maybe PO. Uh, right. Like I said, this isn't uh, this particular thing. Uh, the the no, one num analysis is not rocket surgery. Okay, thank you, Steve. It was very helpful. Okay. That's it for one cat. So uh, I'm going to stop now and ask. Remember, we could also, uh, if we wanted to, we could copy and paste this in using Excel statistics and record it. And there's our our stuff, and it puts it in the data. Um, in our data file rather than in Excel statistics. So that's kind of good. Click the blue button to go back, and there you have it. All right. Hopefully that makes sense to some folks. All right. Pretty straightforward. Uh, pretty straightforward. Let's see if we can go back to this one. There we go. Okay. So at this point... Um, uh, we're going to get to two variable analysis, which is a little more interesting, and we'll do uh, we'll do it in the following order. We'll do categorical output. Remember, that's a some sort of measurement that's usually a yes or no, or maybe it's maybe it's a little bit more than that. Versus categorical input, we'll do numerical output versus category input, and we'll do numerical output versus numerical uh, input. Let's start from this one. Let's start from um, the example that we're going to cover in the text on 31 is something from the gas company. But I would like you all to do the following. I'd like you all to draw a box. I don't want to be ridiculous about this. Draw an output that you can measure as a category. Draw an input that you can measure as a category. And write that down, okay? I want you to do the example. Draw the box. Write down your example. And then we'll talk about a little bit of these in class, and then we'll cover it, okay? So let's take 30 seconds to write down, pick your process, whatever that process is, delivering pizza or making an optical table or paying an invoice or, 
or going out and making an appointment with a doctor or getting a doctor appointed to your to your list of appointed doctors. Tell I couldn't find a word for that one. Okay. Can all of you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, it's not uh, on my screen. It's not going up or down anymore, so I'm wondering what's, what's happening. Okay, so let's go through this, and uh, let's, uh, let's hear from your examples. So let me start with John. John, what was your example of the process that you're looking at? Okay. Uh, for the, the input, I started with, uh, with can't get in, whether it's a yes or a no. And then the output was to uh, was the name of the manager. Name of manager. Okay. Uh, right. So that's the example that's in the book. I was looking for an example in your life of one. <laughs> oh. That's okay. Gotcha. Why don't you? Why don't you? Why don't you? Uh, why don't I ask somebody else? And uh, when we, uh, as we go into this, you can come up with your own examples. So, but you got it. Uh, uh, we're actually going to look at it the other way around. We're going to look at CGI as the output and the name of manager as the input. But uh, let me get another example. So, um, so let's see. Um, uh, Dan, can I can I put you on the spot? Yeah, yeah. So with the you know making of an optical table, I put uh, in input would be tracking the the amounts of scrap, and then maybe the output would be to figure out if it differs by shift. Okay, so I think we're, uh, now maybe I'm wrong on this one, but I think we're looking at the other way around, right? So the output would be the amount of scrap, right? Because that's why you want to ask the question, I wonder if, or you want to, I wonder if, I wonder if shift drives the amount of scrap, right? If you want to look at reducing scrap, this is your key output of measuring the health of the process, right? You want to see if this drives that. Is that right? Okay. Does that make sense? Okay, now. Yeah, I was, I was, yep, go ahead. Okay, so uh, let's look at um, then, uh, is this a category or, or a number? It looks like it's a cat, makes sense. How about amount of scrap? Is that a category or a number? Number? It's probably a number if you're measuring it in like tons, but it could be a category, like if you measured as uh, a high amount of scrap, a medium amount of scrap, a low amount of scrap. So it could be either one. So this could work in a cat cat situation. That might work, depending on how you measured this. Okay, let's get a, let's see if we can get another example. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, Tammy, did you have an example? Yeah, I did. Um, I have doctor appointment wait times. Okay, wait times. But I think mine's going to basically be both a, uh, the one number because I, my inputs were number of patients and number of doctors, and my output was the wait time. Okay. So I'm going to stop us now for just a second, and let's, let's do a do-over. <laughs> let's do a do-over, okay? So, because this is, this is important to get um, uh, so that we can conceptualize what this is. I want to make sure we're on the same page. So let me give an example from my world, okay? And I'm going to do uh, uh, pizza delivery. Okay, now uh, what's something that's important to me as a, to you as a customer if somebody if you have a pizza delivered to you? On time order, correct. Okay, there's a couple of different things. There's how long did it take, the time, right, the wait time for the pizza. But there's also is it correct? Is it the right pizza? Okay, how about is it hot? Mm. Okay, now. The time that it takes, that's a number. Is it correct? Hmm. That could be maybe either, but it's probably, is it correct, yes or no, that's a, that's a cat. But how about, is it hot? 
definitely hot. it's either hot or not. So there you go. It's a cat. Um, great. So this. Uh, so let me pick for this example. Is it hot as a cat? And I might say, I wonder if that's a function of which pizza place I which which place I ordered from, right? If I want to order from um, you know, Little Caesars or Domino's. Um, or if I want to order from Z's Pizza, which is the, uh, the local place that gets the late night crowd. Um, you know, which, uh, which place I might order. Maybe one place it might be hotter, or it might be typically hot more often than, uh, than uh, if I get it from the other. Does that make sense? So this is a cat. Good question, Mark. Yes. Mark, this is Dan. On the, on the time as a number... Could, if, you could, if you said time was either greater than 30 minutes or less than 30 minutes, does that turn into a category? Exactly, it does. Perfect, great question. So here's the, here's the thing. You can always turn a number into a category by dividing. I'm not saying this is a good thing to do, but you can always turn a number into a category by, by putting in different bounds, right? Like the age of a person, um, you could measure it as the number of, as, as is it, but that person's age in years. Like, I happen to be 48 years old. You, that could be a number, right? Or it could be, uh, a, a, you could categorize me as middle age, right? And so then it's a category if you, if you measured it that way. So it all really depends. What I'm really trying to do, though, is build up your intuition so that this isn't just a, the gas company. This is your example that you own. So let's take this, let's take another 30 seconds and see if you can come up with an example from your world that fits category output, category input, okay? So that's going to make sense to you when we go through the motions. Try this one more time. Yes. This is Regina. So I took pizza delivery as well, and I had, is the order correct, was my output, but my input was whether I ordered it by phone or computer. Would that be category owner computer order yes so this is a cat yeah because uh, this is type of order right whoops sorry type of order not sure why it's all over the place type of order right so that is a that's definitely a cat I have to recalibrate this or something that's definitely a cat, because I either ordered it on the computer, or I ordered it on the phone, or I ordered it by smoke signal, or whatever it was, right? Okay, so that will work for this. That will work for this example. Okay? It's worth struggling uh, with this one a little bit uh, until you get it. So uh, let's take another 15 seconds and write down from your world, you know, draw your box, draw your input, draw your output, and let's see if uh, we can get it. In the meantime, I'm going to try drawing one more time. I have a feeling. Oh, no, that's good. All right. I'm looking at the time. Okay, let's try this one more time. Uh, let's see. Uh, Michael, can I trouble you? Okay. Guess not. Uh, let's try, uh, let me ask Steve. Steve, can I trouble you? Yes, uh, I took uh, an example of a transit uh, system or the bus or train. Okay. Um, so my output would be on time. On time, yes or no. Well, that was on time. And yeah. the, for the input is uh, driver or conductor. Who is the driver. Perfect. All right, that makes sense. And notice that it conforms exactly with what Dan was taught, with uh, Dan's example of, is it on time or not? We're not measuring the time that it arrived, which would be a number. Okay, hopefully all of this is making sense. Okay, now let's go for this one. This one is CGI as an output, and we're trying to see if manager drives that CGI, right? So CGI, in this case, for the gas company, is can't get in. So the idea is the gas company... Uh, if you call up and they need have to, they have to have somebody that comes to read your meter. If if they can't get in, if they dispatch a driver and they can't get in, that costs them money. So a typical project at the gas company is, can we figure out how to lower our CGI rate? Okay. So let's go ahead and do this uh, uh, two cat. So here we've got cat cat. So that's two cat analysis. 
All right, let me see if I can get back to my, there we go. So uh, we're going to look up, this one is CGI. Okay, there's my Excel statistics. Now you have to select both. We'll click on 2CAT. And let's take a look at the plots that we get. Okay, so this one's again pretty straightforward. Uh, if we look at the numbers right there, um, it can tell me overall and then how many A's and how many B's. Um, in this case, uh, I guess CGI of yes would be bad. CGI is yes, it was a CGI. That means I can't get in. So um, one thing that's really, really nice about Excel statistics is you can swap these things because sometimes one is easier to read than the other. So just kind of gut check, I guess, before. Let me swap this. Let's see if I can blow this up a little bit. And then I'll swap the variables. And uh, I'll ask you guys which one you think is more is more illuminating. This one or this one? Which one seems to be a little bit easier to read or tell the difference? Interpret. All right, so I guess well, I'll ask... Second one. Uh, well, I guess the second one, because you can immediately do the comparison. So that's, if you're worried about CGI being yes, you can see it. That's what I think, too. I think it's far easier to compare in the second plot, right, because you're trying to see, you're trying to compare managers. And in this case, we've got manager A and manager B. And what do you think? Do you think there's a real difference between these? Do you think CGI is a driver? No doesn't really appear to be, right? Because there's very little yeah. difference between these two things, right? So again, if I'm going to take my, my, my PGA wheel right here, and here I've got CGI, whoops, CGI as a cat, and my input is uh, manager, I am going to have to look elsewhere if I want to make improvements. I can't just say one manager is doing the right thing, one manager is doing the wrong thing, and uh, dig into that. There's no basis for that because there's really no difference between these managers. Very little difference. All right, good. Excellent. So that's basically it for one cat analysis. Now, um, what we're going to be able to do uh, when we do um, more of this as we move forward is we're going to understand what's on these other tabs. So uh, on the first tab, uh, that we just went in is all the graphical stuff. So remember, we're usually doing this PGA. So we'd start by saying, I wonder if there's a difference between managers. Make a graph. No, it doesn't look like that. We we'll want to do some calculation to do some analysis. And I'll show you what that is. I'm not going to spend a lot of time analyzing it right now, but I'm going to show you what that is. And then we're going to make a conclusion. Okay. So let's, we've done the graph and we said, no, it doesn't look like there is, but let's follow up and do a quick calculation to see. Here's the kind of quick calculation that I love because it's, I can put it right on, um, I can put it on, whoops, I'm sorry, I can put it on my plot. And I got this earlier and uh, I'm not seeing it now, but unfortunately I'm not getting the swap the variables uh, right now, but I was getting before you can essentially see when I put on these things right here that there's some overlap between these two error bars right here and that's essentially going to tell me that there is no um, uh, that there's no difference between these two guys. Additionally as we do even more analysis we're going to figure out this right here and this picture right here is going to tell us that there's no difference between these two things. Okay but that's for later. That's not for now. Okay, so quick recap on cat cat. Basically, you know, you you select, you make the uh, you you select the right thing here, right here, which is two cat analysis, and you look for is there a difference between these two? If there is in the graph, then we'll want to investigate that and do a calculation to back that up. If not, we can move on dot org. Okay? Hopefully this made some sense. So Mark, this is Dan. Yes. The data, does it matter that CGI is the output is left of manager the input in the data set? 
No. And, uh, but that's a great question also. And this is another reason why when you select the data, now remember before when we only had one variable and I said, oh, this drop down, it wasn't that interesting. Now look at what happens when I bring down the drop down. Uh, okay. There's this. Now, so we can actually swap these. This tells me manager versus manager, which is not that interesting. But we can change it around. So Excel Stats is going to let me change that around. Okay. And right. um, in this one, it doesn't matter because they're both cat. But in the next one we do, which is going to be one num, one cat, we'll see that it does matter. So, okay. So let's do, uh, let's move on. And uh, uh, let's go on to, uh, let's see if I can find it. Here we go. So uh, there's our cat cat. Or our, yeah, there we go. Um, so, as I said, we, we, our conclusion here is we can't say that there's a difference between manager A and manager B. All right, now let's move on to output as a number, input as a category. So I'd like you to do this as your example now. So take a 30 seconds, draw your box, just like we did last time, and I'll do an example right now. Um, but you can do your own. So uh, my example is going to be for my sales process. So if I have my sales process, one thing that might be important to measure is the number of, uh, is the dollars sold each month. Okay, so my sold dollars. I might want to see if the dollar sold is dependent upon uh, which salesperson. So salesperson A versus salesperson B versus salesperson C, etc. That's my example. This is a num. This is a cat. By the way, this comes up a lot in business, this num cat stuff. Okay, so take a few seconds and just do your example. Okay, let's go through this example now and, um, and uh, see if, uh, is there somebody who'd like to volunteer to, to do an example? I'll try. This is Tammy. Okay, great. Love the confidence there. <laughs> I'll just do my, uh, what was your from process? my appointment process. Appointment. My appointment process for brokers. Uh-huh. And then the input I was doing, which company they're coming from, and the output was the number of brokers per company and the number. Okay, so here's one of the reasons. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I don't start with the input. I start with the output. Remember, the output of a process is something that we're measuring the health on. Whoops. The health of a process. So for this appointment process, uh, would you measure the number of people in that company as something that would... No, you're right. I'd measure the dollar amount of which they generated. Excellent. So that, that's, that's a great one, though, and this is going to work, right? So dollar amount generated, that's for solstice, right? So this is the dollar amount, or is this the amount of business that they, well, I mean, it, it translates into money for you guys, right? Correct. Got it. So this is the amount that they generated based on, like, how many patients were coming in and getting reimbursed. Okay, so that makes sense. I might ask. Does it matter which company they're coming from, which company this provider is coming from, if they're coming from, you know, one group association or a different association? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Okay? Great. That's a great example. How about one more example from somebody else? Thank you, Tammy. John, you want to give it a shot? Yep. Uh, for, like, my, my morning commute, which road you take, and okay, then which time? Got it. Um, you know what the time is. Got it. But let's start with the output first. What's the output there? Output is uh, commute time. Commute time. Love it. That's what matters to you, right? The output is what matters right. to you. Commute time, and that is certainly a num. And your input was which which route? Yeah, which road? Or road. Yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah. Got it. Yep. And uh, you could take the high road, or you could take the low road and see if you get to Scotland before me, I guess. <laughs> All right, excellent. So if those examples, if the example we do in here doesn't work for you, use the example that you wrote down. 
All right, so we're going to cover this last example, um, which is uh, for, let's, let's just, since this one is so important, let's see if we can just get in, um, uh, having all sorts of problemas here. Uh, let's do the, um, we'll do the backlogs before and after, but that's kind of a special case. So I want to do a different one first, and then we'll come back to this, okay? So uh, let's take an example from, um, let's do one that's in the, that will eventually be in your homework so that we can capture it in here. Let's do the one that is on, uh, uh, let's do example five uh, on slide 56, which is on hospital discharge times. And then I'll go ahead and do this as we're kind of uh, going out um, today. Oh, why is this not, there we go. So let's do the one on 56, which is on discharge times. And uh, you'll notice, by the way, when I close out of things, I'm not saving. If you, if you have your own data file, it's okay to save, but you don't want to make saves to Excel statistics because then that, that data is then saved every time you bring it up. And so uh, you probably don't want to do that. Um, all right, so here we've got a process um, where, uh, and let me dr let's draw up the box. As you know, I like to do that all the time. So let's drop the box, and uh, here I've got, I like the black box. My output might be the discharge time, DT, right? Because that's what I care about in a hospital. A hospital might want to be improving its discharge times for patients. If a patient, I come in, how long does it take me to discharge uh, that person from the hospital? Cost them, it's a good customer-centric uh, metric. Um, all makes sense. I might want to be interested in, is this driven by which hospital I'm talking about, right? So if I'm Memorial Hermann, who has, I think at this point, they have 13 hospitals in their system, they might want to say, hmm, I wonder if, hot, if discharge time differs between which hospital the patient was at. Okay, does that context make sense to everybody? That's a, that's a cat, that's a num. All right, so we're going to do a one cat, uh, I'm sorry, a num cat analysis. So again, we select. Whoops, I don't have Excel statistics, so I've got to open it up again. Consequence of me closing everything. I select this, and it does not matter which area I select it. As Dan asked before, I think that was a good question, and you'll see why in just a second. Uh, so in num cat analysis, we do get uh, uh, Excel telling me, here's a number, here's a category, or Excel statistics. So I do have to get this right, but luckily, I can switch it around. So if I messed it up, Excel usually, usually gets angry at me and says, oh, the category variable one that comprises of this current variable appears to have more than five. Oh, yeah, so this is my discharge times. This is actually a number data. That happens often if you have the number as a category. So we just want to switch those around. Make mm -hmm. sure you get your number in the number and the category in the category, and you're all good. Another reason to draw your box. Okay, let's take a look at this pretty quickly. Um, we have a number of different options here, but basically, as you see, we're dividing this up into, uh, uh, you know, which category it's in. Now, don't ask me why it's number one and hospital number one and number three, whatever happened to hospital number two. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> But uh, it tells me how many data points I've got. It tells me the mean. It tells me the standard deviation. And so you can kind of see that. But I want to look at a graph that's going to help me that with that a little bit. So we're going to look at a couple of different graphs. The first is I can make a histogram for each. That's called a separate frequency chart. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Takes a little bit of time to do this guy. Come on, there we go. So what do you think? These are two different, uh, these are two different histograms. What do you think? Do you think that there's differences in the discharge times? You'll notice that it tries to get the, the x-axis right. So a couple people said, yeah. Um, I heard Steve, who, I'm sorry, who else was it that said yeah? Or yes? <laughs> now you're not saying. <laughs> Well, yeah, I said yeah. <laughs> okay, so Steve, why did you say yes? What made you? How well, you it's pretty clear it? on on uh, hospital number one, the data is skewed to the left, so the uh, the lower 
dis discharge time. Yeah, it certainly seems lower for number one than it does for number three. Okay, great. Um, if this plot does it for you, wonderful. You can stop. You can move on. Um, I'm going to show you a couple more plots that are also helpful to read. And you'll see, and, and I want to give you these options because as we do more and more examples, you'll see sometimes one is easier to use than the other. All right, I'm going to close this up. Here's a second type of plot. I'm going to go down to this one right here, which is called a box and whisker plot. So on this one, we can tell uh, uh, what this is, is it's a five number summary of the data. And uh, essentially what you're just doing is just look at this middle part. We'll discuss this more next time. But if you look at this middle part, just the box part right here, just this part right here, if you look at that middle part, um, if you see that one of, those, one of those things is higher than the other, like right here, it looks like this box is sort of between there and this box is sort of between there and so it looks like this box is a little bit higher than the other it, that might indicate that there's a difference in averages between these two groups mm -hmm. okay so that's another plot you might think that that's clear or it's not as clear um, but that's a second plot um, and I'm going to show you one more plot and they're all on this page which is kind of nice Here's the third plot, and this is called a means plot. And uh, for this one, you really do have to click on uh, one of these, and I'm going to click on uh, I'm going to click on standard error. I'm sorry, two standard errors. Uh, STD STD error. Um, um, and this one is going to allow us to examine whether there's difference in averages between these two. And again, this is kind of pointing out there really is a difference between group one and group three. If you were a patient, which hospital would you rather be in? Hospital number one or hospital number two? Number one. Yeah, number one. I mean, this doesn't say anything beyond their discharge time, so they may have, they may discharge you because they treat you poorly. Um, but, <laughs> but, but in terms of just getting out of the place, number one is a better place to be, to be in. Um, okay, I, I'm not going to go into any more than that, uh, and uh, at this point I think uh, just to point, uh, I am going to point out that there's more that we can do to actually do the calculations, and it involves a different page, but um, 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 that's about it. You can see that as we're doing this, just to get the flavor of what the, how to do the analysis, you drop that box, you drop the number in the cat, right? Label them as that. And then by going to Excel statistics, you just click on these things and it presents you with the plot. I mean, what could be easier than that? So we'll continue doing this um, in, I think we'll probably take about a half hour to cover the last one and then do a few examples together uh, on Friday. But hopefully you got a good uh, flavor for how to do all this stuff and, uh, and uh, how to do all these plots. So at this point, I am going to, uh, I'm going to stop the recording and uh, uh, we'll say, let's, I, I know I'm over, so let's meet again on Friday. Uh, in the meantime, you should see uh, from me uh, the homework assignment, which will do, be due two Fridays from uh, this Friday, so you've got some time to do it. Um, and uh, also, I'm going to try and return, uh, uh, have all, the, all your um, assignments returned to you with comments by Friday as well. So we'll see you on Friday, guys. Thanks for all of your time, and uh, I'll stay on for any questions uh, that anybody has. But thanks again for your time today, and we'll see you on Friday. Thank you, Mark. Okay.